I'm taking a short diversion from Gauge 1 Thomas stock to build these three Parkside Dundas O-Gauge wagon kits. I'm building each to resemble rolling stock used on the show rather than their prototype counterparts. And while they're not identical to the show stock, they do look the part. These kits are being built straight out of the box, a welcome change from completely scratch built projects. So it has its instructions, axle side frames, main body, coupling gear, buffers, and the wheels. And that's just about it. Now let's hang these instructions up on the board and get to it. Like any injection molded kit, all the bits have to be cut off the screws before any assembly can begin. And honestly, it takes longer to do this than it takes to glue the top of the wagon together. Assembly begins with the floor and one end first, and the rest follows. Some may recommend doing this with an L square, but it went together quite well without one. One side of the wagon has vertical slats, which go on easily with a quick brush of glue. The other end is hinged on the prototype, and the model represents the locking mechanism with a pair of loops fashioned out of brass rod. The holes are best drilled in advance, and then the wagon end can be fitted. Before fitting the sole bars, I glued onto W irons per the instructions. While this could pose an alignment issue, the molded on detail provided an excellent positioning reference. If there's anything on the kit that's a bit fiddly though, it's the axle friction boxes. Each are two piece castings with brass bushings inside, and the main plastic box needs to be filed on the top for a proper fit. Parkside indicates that the boxes are intended to float freely, but the W irons are too tight as provided, and after you remove the casting flash, you have the opposite effect, the boxes flop around. I chose to glue all of mine in place at ride height. Better rigid cars than bad track work. I snapped in the wheels at this point to make sure nothing bound and to check overall squareness. The wheels also gave me an opportunity to install the brake gear, with the brake shoe sitting nice and tied up against the wheel tread. The coupling hooks are etched brass with brass links. Each of the links have to be spread apart to install. And it also helps if you clean out the slot of the buffer beam of any casting flash so it operates nice and smoothly. To keep the return spring compressed while spreading the forks of the hook isn't easy, but I could probably do this with more precise tools than what you see here. I was surprised to find that the white metal buffer housings, even after casting flash was removed, barely fit the wagon ends. I resorted to what you see here. It's a very crude, if not dangerous, method of drilling them larger. Dangerous for me and dangerous for the integrity of the car. Still, this method actually did work. I don't recommend it. And all the buffer housings fit perfectly. All that remained was to curve the included brass rod and install it, and then off to paint. The details on this Parkside kit are extremely fine, so I used Mr. Surfacer 1000 to primer it. Contrary to many online claims, I find that the spray version of Mr. Surfacer is much more of a detail primer than a filler of surface imperfections. And while I'd usually choose purpose intended hobby paint for the color coat, I went ahead and used a camouflage Krylon color, which I found works just as well as any hobby paint to retain surface details. The wheels were also shot with the same paint. A single color did look right on this particular car, so I masked off the top using Tamiya masking tape and newspaper advertisements. The remainder was shot in flat black and then the fun began. For better or worse, I'm convinced that the Tamiya weathering kits are really just non-metallic makeup kits, right down to the foam applicator, which doesn't really work that well. The end result was worth it though, and the truck presents really nicely. Stay tuned for the next Parkside build, where we tackle a four-plank northeastern wagon.